Well, in any event, what I wanted to do is uh, present you with a program with, that really breaks down the, our, our understanding of exactly how food works as medicine. And on, your next, on the next uh, slide of the handout, this is, gives you an overview of what I've prepared for you. So in the first section, we're going to be discussing this whole notion of food as medicine. Uh, is it really true that we can simply regard food as medicine, and to what extent? Uh, even more importantly, I'd like to ask what the medical literature currently says about medicinal properties of foods like curcumin, for example, or fish oil. Uh, and we're gonna be taking a really close look at, at this, some of the claims that are made. Uh, one of the, the other ways of discussing this is to discuss food products by their various, uh, the various categories in which we can treat illness. For example, you know, we could take inflammatory illnesses and ask which food products treat inflammation, or we could look at medical food, pro or food products, I should say, in terms of their overall structure. Personally, I find that the best way of exploring this wide open field is to discuss foods in terms of their mechanism of action. In other words, by asking what is it specifically that they do within the body that affects our health. And so for that reason, I've divided the program into sections that correspond to major mechanisms of action that we'll be exploring. So in the, the first of three sections, we're gonna be considering medical foods that alter neurotransmitter levels. And you re may remember that neurotransmitters are the chemical messengers in our brain that govern just about every, every uh, mode of uh, communication that occurs between our neurons. So we're gonna be looking at categories of medical foods that actually change or purported to change or alter our neurotransmitter levels. In the next section, we're gonna be taking another look at uh, another type of uh, functional category, and this is a category that includes medical foods that address inflammation. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, whether it's through Dr. Oz or through even scientific journals, the fact that chronic inflammation is becoming a, a topic of increased interest among medical researchers. And part of the reason is that there are many chronic illnesses that have chronic inflammation as their underlying cause. So we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna be exploring this whole idea of you know, what exactly chronic inflammation is, but even more importantly, we're gonna be taking a look at certain types of foods, both regular foods as well as medical foods, that actually address inflammation. In the third section, uh, listed here under uh, bullet four there, medical foods that affect nutri nutrient metabolism will be con considered. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean, that, I mean foods that affect how, how other nutrients are themselves metabolized. So for example, we'll be looking at things like coconut oil. It turns out that coconut oil is composed of a class of compounds known as medium chain triglycerides. And medium chain triglycerides, in fact, have a very interesting uh, way of being handled by the body. Uh, just to make a long story short, basically what happens is when we have, uh, when our nutrient sources are scarce or depleted, the body will preferentially turn over its uh, energy handling to, to relying on medium chain triglycerides as a primary source of energy, that is instead of glucose. So we're gonna be taking a look or unpacking some of that, seeing how we might uh, gain some uh, health benefits by using coconut oil. And then in the final section, we're gonna be taking all of this information, tying it together, and I'll be giving you a set of practical strategies for how to use these foods foods, again, that you may already have in your, your kitchen as we speak uh, to possibly get uh, or gain some health benefits. Now, I want to be clear at the outset in this program, uh, you know, I don't, I typically don't prescribe foods for my patients, okay? Now, as a psychopharmacologist, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about how drugs affect the body, and it's been my experience that I could have a blockbuster drug in my hands or in my repertoire, but if patients aren't addressing the other aspects of their health, in other words, if they're not exercising or if they're not mindful of their diet, then the drug is going itself 
or alone is going to do very little to bring about the changes that are desired. We're going to talk in this section about medical foods that treat inflammation. Okay, and as I pointed out earlier, inflammation is more or less of a buzzword these days, at least among certain medical professions. It seems that just about every chronic condition has an inflammatory component to it. So, you know, as a, as a, as a medical professional, I'm hard pressed to think of uh, chronic illnesses that don't involve some degree of chronic inflammation. And I think much of the interest in chronic inflammation is really driven by many of the insights from basic cell biology and biochemistry that uh, have been made over the last 10 years. And the insights basically have to do with various factors that regulate the inflammatory process. And what we're finding, much to our surprise, is that there are many, many ingredients or nutrients that are co very common in our diet that have a very profound impact on our levels of inflammation. And this, in part, is what's driving this interest, the, the realization that it's not through drugs that we have potent ways of affecting our inflammatory processes, although drugs do certainly have a role. Uh, a role. Uh, but surprisingly, we were finding things that things like fish oil and curcumin also have very potent ways of regulating levels of inflammation in our body. So in this section, what I'd like to do is kind of give you a brief overview of those medical foods that target inflammation. And in doing this, I'd like to focus on some of these major inflammatory pathways. Now, it may be a little bit more basic cell biology than you want to know in a seminar like this, but I think it's worth the extra effort to understand some of these basic ideas of cell biology. By cell biology, I mean inflammatory pathways, because once you understand how a pathway works, you're better equipped to understand some of the claims that are made for certain nutrients that affect these pathways. Uh, one pathway we'll be looking at is uh, something known as the nuclear factor kappa B pathway, NFKB for short. And this turns out to be a major regulatory uh, pathway for inflammation. And it turns out that <clears throat> a lot of the nutrients that we'll be talking about have a direct impact on suppressing this pathway that leads to inflammation. So for that reason, I think it's worth a while to spend the extra five minutes or so talking about that. All right, so let's uh, begin with a, just a general uh, idea of how widespread chronic inflammation is. Now, it's estimated that as many as two-thirds of Americans have some form of chronic inflammation. Okay, so, so pretty widespread phenomena. I mean, alone, if you just think of obesity, uh, it's estimated that as many as two-thirds of Americans, and two-thirds happens to be about 66% of Americans, are overweight. And we now know that there's good evidence that links obesity to uh, dysregulation of inflammation. In other words, evidence pointing that Obesity is, in fact, a disorder of chronic inflammation. So by that alone, you can understand how widespread this phenomenon is. But on this slide, we're looking at the various disorders that have been associated with chronic inflammation. <clears throat> so you can see things like diabetes, for example, cardiovascular disease, uh, brain diseases that include uh, Alzheimer's, depression, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, the list goes on and on, and this is by no means a comprehensive list. Just kind of gives you a, a idea of the variety of illnesses that are believed to have a uh, have chronic inflammation as part of their basic pathophysiology. All right. So <clears throat> another interesting insight, again over the last ten years or so, is that there's a lot that we can do to control levels of inflammation in our body. It's not as if you know, we're born with certain genes that, you know, that are predisposed to putting us in an inflamed state. It turns out that we have a much higher level of control uh, for how our inflamed our body is based on the lifestyle decisions we make. And here's just a partial list of some of the things that affect levels of chronic inflammation. So this includes things like exercise. It turns out that exercise, when modulated in the appropriate way, can be very beneficial for reducing chronic inflammation. 
right? So now some of you may think, well, wait a minute, I, that doesn't ring true because every time I go for a run, I come back and my knees ache and they ache for a few days afterwards. How can that be good for chronic inflammation, right? Well, it turns out that occasionally the, the systems in our body that suppress inflammation need themselves to be exercised, right? It's, you know, it's kind of the old use it or lose it phenomenon. There are mechanisms, pathways in our body that suppress inflammation, okay? If we never challenge those pathways, then they become less effective over time. So some people have proposed that exercise can be a very effective way of tuning up our immune system, of presenting it with just a very slight challenge so that it, you know, flexes its muscles, so to speak. And, uh, you know, when we're exercising, our immune system is exercising. The, you know, it's, again, it's about moderation because exercising too little can have effects on our inflammatory system, but so too obviously can exercising too much. So we're just beginning to uncover the fact that exercise does have a role, and specifically the way that this works is that exercise has a, a, a role in, in the production of a class of compounds known as cytokines, C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. And cytokines are to the immune system what neurotransmitters are to our neurons. In other words, they're the chemical messengers that work from cell to cell uh, in our immune system. So it turns out that exercise is a very important way that we have of controlling that. Nutrition, obviously, and that's really the, the focus of this section, uh, there's also evidence that obesity can be, is a, just a manifestation of chronic inflammation. Uh, we know, for example, that people who are obese tend to have higher levels of inflammatory markers in their body. These inflammatory markers you may have heard of, they go by names like interleukin-1, interleukin-6. Um, there's other inflammatory markers of like CRP, C-reactive protein. Uh, all of these are, are increased in certain subsets of people with, with obesity. Not everyone, but certain subsets. And so it really does lead us to think that maybe there is a, a, a connection there. I pointed out earlier that sleep deprivation is a common phenomenon. Um, what I probably need to emphasize now is that the, the fewer amount of time that we spend in that deep stage of sleep, stage in three and four, the more inflamed we become. Okay, so it's almost as if any time we get a good dose of stage three or four sleep, that deep sleep, we're getting a good dose of nature's anti-inflammatory drug because it has a very profound uh, effect on suppressing inflammatory markers in the body.